So Brendan, this is the first time we've actually met and it is virtually. Um, thanks for coming on today's podcast. Firstly, you've done a half marathon today. We'll explain the reasons why in a minute, but how are you feeling? Yeah, I'm feeling, um, I'm feeling good. It's day number eight. Um, that's eight half marathons in a row. Um, and I'm feeling relaxed. I'm feeling strong. I've put a lot of miles in this year. I wasn't expecting to do a challenge this year. My last challenge was back in 2018. Uh, last year, I hardly ran much and put quite a lot of weight back on. Um, so I didn't. I started uh, running well in January with a race, an ultra race planned for October, obviously with coronavirus and lockdown. And then out of the blue, um, I was inspired by the campaign for Chester Zoo. And I thought, do you know what? Let's get involved. Let's do a challenge. Let's go for it. <laughs> so that is what's all about. So what is the challenge you've set yourself for Chester Zoo? So the challenge um, for Chester Zoo is um, I'm running a half marathon every day in June. Um, I start on the 4th of June. Then I will cover the marathon distance every day in July. And then on the August the 1st, I'm going to run from Media City um, to Chester Zoo, which is around 35 miles. Wow. And then just to make it a little bit more fun, on the 20th of June, I've signed up for the GB Ultras virtual race series, um, uh, the Joggle, uh, which is 825 miles. So people following will be able to, I log the miles at the end of each day, and then it will show you on the UK map how far I've come down from obviously starting in John O'Groats. So that will make it a little bit more fun. But because I'm feeling good, I'm looking forward to the, the race start. And I think I'm, I might give it a little bit of a, see what I can pull out the bag. And then there's going to be some fancy dress thrown in. So there might be some random animals running around Manchester. I was going to say, please tell me that you are going to fancy dress at some point. I'm a big fancy dress person. And as you're doing this for the animals, I'm hoping to see a gorilla, a tiger, an elephant. Yeah, and I, I think, I think in, and obviously with the schools not going back, and I work in special educational needs at Ladywood School, which is near Bolton. Um, and I just think, do you know what? The children aren't, a lot of children aren't going back. Um, you know, there's lots of, you know, we are in an uncertain time. I just thought, do you know what? I want to make it fun. I'm going to make people smile. Then I might be, I don't know, I might be a big giraffe running all around Manchester. Hope, hope, I hope I make lots of people laugh, lots of people online. I just think it's, we've got to have a bit of laughter and a bit of fun in this climate because it is tough for, for many different reasons. So with Chester Zeus, for those that don't know, um, you're, they put a campaign out saying, look, we need your help, you know, because of COVID, you know, our funds are going low. We've got none coming in because we're shut. Please tell us what's your Just Giving page and why yeah. you're why you picked Chester Zoo. Chester Zoo. So, so I'm based in the northwest now I'm in Manchester like I said um, and it's one of the, the biggest zoos in the country I really want to do something for, for years I've been raising a lot of money for a project in Africa yeah um, we'll talk about that later because I'm really and, interested um, in that and um, I just wanted to do something in the northwest that could pull people together I've gone many times over the years um, I've taken lots of children there I love their conservation programs. They, you know, they have got lots of conservation programs. Um, they help and protect some of the giraffe in Uganda. Um, and I think it's a very special place. And, you know, I think that if you, if you start to, obviously they rely a lot on their entrance fees. And, you know, if that starts to go, um, you know, you, you could lose one of the best attractions. Um, and zoo, zoos are a very educational place. Um, and all the staff, you just got to watch them when they were doing the appeal. They're so passionate about the animals. Um, so I just thought I wanted to do something for the area. Um, so anyone that is interested and inspired, because even though they are reopening, I was reading before that they usually have, I think it was like, for example, like 10,000 people can go through the gates a day. But obviously with the COVID and the social distancing, you're looking at three. They've already lost three months um, admissions. So, you know, it's, it's the fight's not over. I think in the long term, they still, they still need our support. So you can go on uh, my Just Giving. If you type in Brendan Rendell, Just Giving Chester, it will come up on Google. Or you can look at, find me at, on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, Brendan Rendell. Um, and then obviously your people will be able to find it on there, the link. So are you in communication with Chester Zoo? How are, how are yeah. they feeling about yeah. you doing this challenge for them? Yeah, they, they, we've exchanged some emails. and. 
I'm sure nearer the time when I'm actually running to the zoo, we'll, we'll make it a bit of an event, hopefully. Um, I've just received some t-shirts this morning and obviously they're really grateful and obviously really grateful for everyone that's trying to, to help. So, um, and obviously I, I really like the idea of, um, obviously the goal is to raise money for them. Uh, but I also like to inspire people along the way that we can all do our little bit. Um, it doesn't matter if it's a 1K or a marathon, you know, you just have to be the best that you can be. And not everyone has got the time to do these big challenges. But, you know, it's just about pushing and pushing a little bit out of your comfort zone is always a good piece of advice, I think. So as you said, you like a challenge. And I did do a bit of reading up about you. And I really have to ask, two years ago, 2018, you went to Africa. Please tell me the story of Africa. So, um, so if I went back to, to 2016, I ran uh, 27 marathons in 27 days, uh, the length of Malawi, because I've been involved with a project in Malawi for several years. Um, and it really inspired me that I could potentially do something bigger. I kind of thrived on the, on the heat there and the conditions. Obviously, you're stripped of all your luxuries, you're camping along the way. And then I flew back, um, and that was the year. That, and one of my pledges to get to, to make people uh, get outside more was to run Joggle. So I actually ran John O'Groats to Land's End, which was 962 miles in 35 days. So those two sort of big runs back to back inspired me that actually I could run across Africa. So 2018 beginning of June, I, I ran out of the Atlantic Ocean in Namibia. Just insane. It was desert. It was 35 degree heat. There was no shade. I was camping. I was stripped of luxuries. I didn't, I, you know, I finished the marathon distance. I didn't have any showers or any luxuries, but that didn't matter because the, the sun, the sunrise and sunsets and the wildlife, it was, it was just incredible. And then I went up through the Caprivi Strip and into Zambia. And then from Zambia, I went into Victoria Falls and then oh, went over wow. to Malawi um, and then down into the charity where I raised, I raised 35,000 on my Malawi run, which helped finish the school. So we ran back into the school on, the, on my Africa run and then through FOMO. And then I went, went into Mozambique and then I ran into the Indian Oceans. Uh, so it was 2,474 miles, uh, 98 days, seven days I lost to illness and so it was 91 running days. The most I ran in one day was 40 miles and the most in one week was 220 miles, yeah. Well, I have to ask, how many trainers did you go through? I went through, I had six pairs. So ASICs, um, I always run in ASICs. So um, I had six pairs because when I ran Malawi, I only had two and I realised that the amount of miles that you do and it's really important to keep changing them. Obviously, you've got to find what works for you. So for me, it, I... I just did several hundred and then I would bring another pair in and then rotate them. And then once I'd done four, what, four or five hundred in one, I would then bring in the next pair in. I was just conscious because of a slight leg problem I had in Malawi that I didn't want to get that wrong. And it, and it really worked for me just to keep that extra support because I have got um, orthetic. So for me, it's quite important because one leg is very, very slightly shorter. Um, and so it's important, especially going that distance and covering yeah. that amount. So, yeah. So... That is that is just amazing. That is just the like the biggest running challenge I've heard of to date at the moment. And I have to ask, like, oh, I, I'm just gobsmacked that you were able to do it. But I have to ask, did you have a team? Because yeah, so, yeah, so um, I had a very small support team. So how it worked was we had a support truck, um, and then they have we had two tents in the truck. I have a support cyclist. Um, who's with me closely um, with the walkie-talkie and then obviously having the truck you could stock up with you know we could hold a lot more water stock up on food because there were certain stretches where you wouldn't really see a shop for example um, there was lots of areas where we went through like the Caprivi strip because lots of animals go from Botswana up into Angola so you you need to have that kind of I mean you can do it by foot people do do it uh, but that's just the way that I wanted to do it um, and plus for me, the vehicle was great because some days when it was really hot, I could at least get into the truck and have some kind of shade or use the door to at least have some shade to get out, out of the heat. So I had a team of five. And then how it would usually work was we would either find a village um, and camp. We'd speak to the chief and we'd say, hi, I'm, 
running across Africa, can you camp? And they were just so kind and they were like, oh, welcome to, this is your home for the evening. And it was really humbling. And, um, and they would rush around and get bits of wood for us to sit on as a seat. And it was just, it was, I call it the 98 days of kindness because it was just, it gave me so much faith in humanity. Um, so yeah, so that's how it worked. And then as I went across, like there were some luxury lodges that we kind of ended up staying in, which we needed at certain times. There was one in yeah. Zambia where we got to Victoria Falls and I was doing a 40 mile day. We hadn't showered or done anything for two weeks. We were really, you know, pretty smelly. And then <laughs> just, this a woman, bit. just a bit. <laughs> and, then this, um, and then this woman called Claire, who had this most beautiful um, set of lodges reached out she heard that I was I was coming and she said right how many is there you've got a bed and we had a hot shower and good food and that set me off on to the next stage so yeah so that's how it worked so did it help you mentally as well was it the team because obviously 98 days you must have had some point where you was like why am I doing this you know I've got the heat beaming down body's tired were there moments where you was like I've got, I'm going to give up or was it the fact that you was around this beautiful and scenery you saw amazing wildlife that you thought and you was raising money for a school that kept you going yeah there's lots of different factors obviously um if you, if you sort of grasp the idea that you're stripped of everything so like running here I could stop and think oh I'm going to get to that news agent I'm going to get a nice pint of cold drink or a Mars drink or whatever but there you're literally stripped of everything. So it literally does push you to the absolute max from the food to the drink, the water in the van was warm. Um, and then it, it, sometimes the team, I mean, the team were phenomenal because they did it, they did everything, they would go ahead. Sometimes that was an extra pressure when you, especially if you were in a bit of a darker moment and you're, you just got to get your head around what's, what you've got to do. And they're trying to be their best, but, but you just want that space, but then you need them because that kept you going. The children on the way to school, um, the locals, they would go five, 10 kilometers. And people that followed and have seen videos have seen sometimes I'd have one, 200 children running along with me. That would oh, keep wow. going. Um, and every time I got, I, I kind of had a moment where I was struggling, I was just kind of reflecting and I thought, do you know what? I'm never ever gonna, Read. and I suppose it's like mindfulness in some ways I just thought do you know what engage the pain engage whatever because you're just so lucky to even be doing this to be experiencing this and I just kept thinking that you're going to have ups and downs because that's what you do in challenges and it's how you deal with them and how you cope in those lower moments so you kind of have to just accept it and learn how to cope with it and know that once you get through that you will get another day where you'll lift again um, but yeah, the children, they kept you going. And then the sunrise and sunsets were just dramatic. And seeing some of the wildlife, you know, we, we ran past zebra and giraffe and elephants, and that kept me going. Um, and obviously having Malawi and FOMO and the project, the third country through, that was another big, you know, goalpost to get to. So there was lots of, lots of things that, that would keep, keep me going. I got, I got ill seven days before the end. Um, I knew I had severe sickness and diarrhea and um, I actually ended up having three days off um, I was put on a drip um, but it's really funny because I would had it similar in India um, and I had some um, antibiotics but the first thing I thought was well at least my legs are getting a rest so <laughs> <laughs> well, I just thought let's see this through and then um, so that was probably the tough, toughest part because obviously as people know here, when you've been unwell, it's hard to eat. And obviously running that distance and eating is essential. So literally there's pictures of me the last week sat like under a tree. Because at that point there was only me and one support vehicle because some of the team went back to Malawi. Um, and um, I really struggled to eat that last week. So for me, that was the heart of it. Um, so 98 days, you're talking about food. I am curious, what was your diet, your so, daily diet? Oh, where are you? Hello. Yes. Yeah. Um, and then, oh, low sorry, you was cutting out a bit. Okay, so I was asking you, what was your daily diet? Yeah, so we would stock up with rice and pasta, um, and then we would stop off at like the little get um, tomatoes. And then one of the lads from the charity came. He was an amazing cook, and we cooked up just pasta dishes, rice, curries, 
we'd buy some local chicken um but it was very very basic i mean you don't you know every now and again i did manage to get salt and vinegar crisps oh. uh, <laughs> That's a plus. You've got to get the salt in. Coca Cola. Yeah, um, Coca Cola was a big one, and I also had was lucky that when I got to some more built-up areas, I could stock up with. Um, there's a couple of videos of me eating boxes of Cheerios, but I did manage to find quite a lot of way along um, in the little shops. They did have this chocolate milkshake, um, and I did have I did have that, but it literally was you know I just ate what I could because it was it was quite limited we when we did get to a bigger supermarket we did stock up a lot with peanut butter and jam yes. we had peanut butter and jam sandwiches and then we had porridge in the morning but it's not like the porridge here it's a bit more gloopy but it was just i think the thing is you're so focused on what you've got to cover that you're just you're not really thinking about the taste of it it's just you do go into this get calorie it. get it in um none of it was actually that great at times because i think you lose your appetite when it's that hot so did you salt lose oops, sorry salt, you said. salt and vinegar crisps were just amazing though <laughs> <laughs> so did you lose much weight um yeah i lost quite a lot by the end i think i lost about nearly two stone before the end um so yeah i did there's a picture of me when i got up a hill when i look back i i look quite um gaunt yeah, yeah i look quite gaunt at, at one so yeah yeah i did so when you finished yeah. did you was the finish at the school that you was at the area where you was the school was going to be built at? what was your finish like so the finish was so we went through because the project fomo's in malawi so i left there and then i ran into the indian ocean so running into the sea i ran out of the sea 98 days previous in the nibia so i ran out of the atlantic ocean and then my goal was to run it obviously into the indian ocean so and it was really beautiful because we finished on the island of Mozambique and it's a two kilometer bridge that they've built across to the island. And as soon as I got to the coast, I kind of knew that, well, I've done it. So that extra two kilometers to the island was just like a victory lap. Like I went through every emotion and it was like, you know, my whole life on that, that, that road of, you know, it was like the ups, the downs, the heat, the animals. It was kind of like quite emotional for me. And then obviously seeing the sea and I just ran in. Um, and it was just, yeah, it was an amazing feeling. They're always a kind of strange feeling when you finish a challenge, though, because you're so focused to get to that point. And then sometimes when you get to it, you're obviously ecstatic and afterwards you are. But it is almost like the day after you're like, right. That's what I was going to ask you. To doing something. That's what I was going to ask <laughs> you. So you, you ran for 98 days. All right, you had a few days off, but let's be honest, main 98 days. And then the next day. Did you go out for a little jog just to loosen the legs a bit? Or did you think, that is it, <laughs> the legs are up for months, no, no more? It's really interesting because I remember this so clearly because this just shows you the mindset that I got into during the run. So the following day, um, I didn't run, but I wanted to go for a bit of a walk. But there was a really nice pizza restaurant and it was only about 12 o'clock and I'm, we were walking across this beautiful square and I said, let's get out of this heat, it's too hot. This is just too hot. And it really, for the first time in 98 days, actually, I actually realized how hot it was because I think I was so programmed to that keep going, keep going, that you almost block it out, which I find fascinating that we can adapt like that because the day that I finished, I was just like, it's just too hot. Get <laughs> <shitty."> <laughs> um, so I, I took several days off and then I just did some gentle runs for a month. Um, just to keep ticking over. I know, I know there are lots of people then sometimes do half a marathon for a month. And it, again, it's what works for you. I've never done that, but I've always done smaller runs just but to keep going. But I walk a lot. So that's kind of how I leveled it up, to be, to be fair. Do you get, I'm one of those ones that after a marathon, I, I have a massive come down. I don't know why, if it's because of all, like you said, the emotions of, you know, oh my God, I've done it in adrenaline. Mm -hmm. But I am, it's not so much the next day, it's the day after. I go on a massive come down and I'm like, what's happening? I've just done something amazing and I can't get out of it. Do you, do you have that effect on you? Especially after a big challenge like that, because how can you do anything bigger than what you just did? Yeah, it was really weird because... If I look back now, which is a good time period to actually reflect now, 
at the time I didn't, I think because I was still in Africa um, and I had like four days in Mozambique and it was beautiful where we stayed. Then I flew back and had some interviews and then I went straight back to work. So working with kids with, uh, love it. So I think I kept busy. Um, I was running really well and then I got a cold in the January and then it was basically, it was all of last year. It then hit me. I was really running well until January and I was expecting that I could pull off a quite a good ultra race because I was back in form and I hadn't raced for several years um, and I was looking forward to pushing it. And I would say probably from the January when I had this cold that just lingered, literally all of last year was written off. I'd lost the whole mojo. Um, I didn't finish a race, um, which was a Liverpool to Manchester. It was the first thing I've never finished. Um, I, only had, I only had 13 miles to go. I mean, I could have walked it. I had loads of time for the cutoff. Um, and I just sat in, the, in this sit checkout point and a lot of people I know there. And I just said, I'm, I'm done. And they thought I was, they, for 10 minutes, they thought I was just taking Joking. The, yeah, joking. I said, no, I, I said, I'm not. And I think that on reflection, that's, I didn't have, the passion wasn't there. I didn't want it that much for whatever reason. And then I, it was a kind of a distraction last year, which I don't regret. I did lots of running and stuff. Sorry, so you said that it cut out a, a bit. Sorry, Brendan, it cut out a bit. You said, and then, and then it and went then, blank. Sorry. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I got a puppy, um, oh. Ralph, wreck it Ralph. He's a fox terrier who's amazing. So um, I think last year I spent more time walking with him and stuff. And then um, I gained around two and a half, three stone. Um, and then... I beginning of this year I wrote down why I ran why I loved it um and how I started it which is I started running in 2006 after a bet because I wasn't a runner before that and it, and it was always when I used to run at five o'clock in the morning so it was around the 6th of January this year and I thought I'm not gonna look I'm gonna put my running watch on but I'm not gonna look at the distance I'm not gonna look at the speed I'm gonna go out before work if it's five minutes or ten minutes and basically, cut a long story short, that's what I've been doing ever since. And my whole passion for running has come back. There's, there, was no, there was no challenges. There was no... It was going out and having that structure before work. Getting to work, feeling energised, focused. And it sort of like ignited it again, which was really good. Um, so I've had, a, I've had a good year this year. Um, hence why, if you go full circle, why I've ended up doing this challenge, which wasn't planned for Chester Zoo. But I just kind of felt that I'm not going to be able to do a race this year. So I may as well uh, do a sort of short, even though it is a big challenge, because it's still 1,204 miles by August. Um, I still can then use August to just to do very small runs to recover with the idea that I would like to do a few races next year. So you said earlier that you're a late runner. So obviously, did you run at school? Did you run in your teens? What was your sport? Was you a football fan and you'd play Sunday football matches or rugby or how? I want to get to this bet. You're not getting away without telling me about the bet. So tell me about yourself. So at school, I was always one of those people that was picked last for sport. I hated it. I was always the one where the teacher would go, right, Brendan, you're with team A because no one would pick you. Um, by the age of 16, I think I started my relationship with food as comfort eating. So I was kind of quite overweight, probably by 17, 18. Um, I only finished school with two GCSEs. My sister had gone to private school. She was really academic. Um, and I didn't feel like I was good at anything. Um, I then was going to work in a supermarket full time, but then went back to college to try and get my maths, but failed it again. Then I did some GMVQs and then I ended up coming to Salford, Manchester to do a BTEC. Um, and then that year, really, because I come from the small town and come to a city, I got kind of right. It, and obviously all the student loans we were getting, I got all into the Manchester club scene. Um, I did manage to talk my way onto an art degree because I did, I did a project. And I suppose that's where that passion drive comes out, even back there. But then sadly, for about 10 years, my life was a cycle of self-destructive behaviour. I got heavily into drugs, drink, um, and it was literally, I lived for, the, for every night we would, we would be out. Everything's a bit of a blur. 
And then 2006, there was a group of people out at the end of 2005, sorry. And a couple of the people were doing a half marathon I'd never ran before. Um, it was the Wilmslow half, so I had three months to train for it. And I got up in the morning in the dark in a hoodie so no one could see me. And I thought, I thought, right, let's just, let's give it three months and see what happens. Um, and then after several weeks, I literally was lamppost to lamppost. It wasn't even a quarter of a mile. It was, but I was really determined and I was getting up every day before work. And then as it went on, I used to double up and do the evening as well. Um, and I started to see the structure and the discipline and, um, and that kind of structure and discipline then paralleled into my actual personal life, like facing up to debts and stuff. It was like a knock up, like a domino effect. I started to find places in Manchester I never knew existed, like the canal pass that you could go all the way out towards Runcorn and Liverpool or go out toward the Peak District. So it kind of ignited so many things. And then I remember the, the last mile of this half marathon, three months later, I lost about three stone. And... Um, wow. I was just running really quickly. I was in so much pain. Then the next day, um, I didn't have a running watch back then. Um, the next day I lived on the, in, in this block of flats. We were on the first floor. And I thought, oh my gosh, my legs. I had to go down backwards. I'm sure every, loads of runners have <laughs> that feeling. Um, I had to go down backwards. And then I got a message in the evening from a friend saying, you were absolutely flying. Um, and then I went to look at my time. Um, I ranked quite highly. I did one hour 24. Wow. Um, for my first, first half. For my first half, yeah. Um, and then it was like, oh, I'm going to come back out, guys. We'll go clubbing at the weekend. I never set out on this journey to do adventure and running and ultra. I never even thought I'd run a marathon. Because when I finished that line, I thought, God, how the hell do these people do this marathon? Because that would mean the, doing that whole course again. Uh, and then um, four weeks later, yeah, it was the... May, um, and that was my first 10k and I was I ended up being in the top sorry what was it you said four weeks later and then it cut out four weeks I later did the Man Manchester 10k yeah um, and then I um I ended up being in the top 200 um and I ran that in 38 minutes 05 um it and sounds like you're a natural runner and then um and then I um then I concentrated a little bit on 10 Ks and half. So I got my half marathon down to 122. Um, and then I ran the, my fastest 10 K was 37, 30. And then I was, I got a London marathon place. And when I look back now, that was 2009. And when I look back now, it was like, it just shows you my inexperience back there. And it was frustrating, but I can't be frustrated because it, I still did something amazing. So I got this, this marathon place. And I knew that I could break three hours. I just feel like I, could, I knew I could do it. And um, I thought, oh my God, to break three hours on my first marathon would be phenomenal. So going into it, I ran 122, 122 half. I ran a 37 minute 10K. And then I went up to, to Lancaster and did the triple 20. And I did it in two hours 11. Two and hours toes 11. And legs. Yeah. And then um, I, I completely relaxed. Like I knew I could do it. And then um, three weeks before the London, I was doing the Blackpool half and I was going to try and go for about 121. Obviously then unwind to London. And I don't know why. It's probably the biggest regret I did. Someone had wanted to swap from the marathon to the half um, because they, did, they, they hadn't trained. But the week before, I'd missed a 22-mile run. So in my head, I thought, I'll do a 22-mile race, and then I'll just, I could walk, run the end. Um, so I swapped. And what was really, really frustrating now, I started really far at the back, and I just was running, and then I was just at 20 miles, I was feeling really, really strong, and I was on for sub three. Then I got to 22 and I was on for sub three. And then I thought to myself, no, this is ridiculous because I want to break it in London because I was so inexperienced. What I should have done now, which I know now is forget London. When something clicks, you should have just gone for it. Yeah. Um, so the last four miles, I literally slowed right down and I did it in three hours, 13. Um, 
And then three, three, and three weeks later, I had London. I was on for three hours for, uh, at 20 miles. But because of that marathon the three weeks before, it I could you. really start to feel it in my legs. And as everyone knows as runners, where that confidence in Blackpool was, right, I can get the next runner. In London, it was, I shouldn't have done Blackpool. And obviously, when you start to spiral... Mentally. Mm. mentally um, I still ran that in three hours, 13. Um, so... Hey, that's just like a nut. Wow. And you should have known. You should have known that from a half marathon training to a marathon is totally different. <laughs> yeah, so... But my, my biggest regret, though, is because is I know from my experience now that I should have just ignored London. And honestly, out of all the races I've done, that Blackpool half, I was absolutely... I got to 20. I hadn't, didn't even feel... I was completely on fire. I should have just gone for it and then just enjoyed London and thought, you know what, I've got a sub three hour. But again, it's lack of experience. But to think I ran two marathons in three weeks, both sub 3.15 is pretty impressive. Um, and so I have to ask, have you done a marathon under three hours? I haven't, I haven't raced the marathon since that, um, that, three, that, that 2009, yeah. So what, it was just a case of what changed your mentality then? Well, um, so, if, so basically in 2008, to so go back a little bit, I went to Africa to cycle across Malawi, one of the poorest countries in the world. Um, and I just fell in love with, with Malawi. And it changed everything for me. It put loads of things in life into perspective. Um, you know, seeing that extreme poverty, they haven't got anything in so many ways, but they have everything. They have this kind of happiness and this appreciation for life that we never understand. Um, so I became this, very... Can I just ask as well, because you said about, you know, the... Oh, sorry, my dog in the background. I've got a rough collie, by the way. <laughs> um, the, you, you're saying like, you, you know, got in a spiral of mm. drugs and drink, mm. drink, yeah, as well, yeah. and the party scene. Mm. You took up running. Did that become your new addiction? And did... Obviously, you couldn't have just suddenly stopped doing those things. It must have built up... You must have weaned yourself off. Or did you carry on? Obviously, you couldn't have with the running. Like, when did you separate the drugs and the alcohol to the running and think, "Hang on, this is my new, my new yeah, drug." I think, I think, I think the thing was, I think because I started to realise that I was running quite quickly. Those, when I look back, those years from partying to then running, it wasn't a conscious thing. I just really saw the benefits of not drinking, and 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 I was. I've not drank really. I've had like three drinks since 2006. Um, I think the whole, it's just been a really exciting domino effect of feeling good, feeling focused to help me clear all my debts. It made me, you know, inspired me to go to Malawi, like I was saying, um, travel. So it's just been a positive kind of mindset. Um, so yeah, did you just... change friends? Like, did you find your circle of friends as well? Like I found when I started running as well, because I'm only seven years at this moment in time, I started running. Your friends, or like the, the ones that are like, why do you run? I don't understand it. And then you've, obviously you have your close friends that, you know, love you, whatever. But you do have certain friends that are like, oh, the interests start widening and the friendships start, is that what happened to you? Like with the party friends, it started and then you um, found I think, inner peace and travel and Malawi, your mindset. Yeah, I think, I think my, I think my mindset has changed a lot to a lot of people because I think, I don't think a lot of people get that total freedom that I kind of, have kind of learned to have now, but I think, yeah, my, well, there's several clubbing friends that have got, as they've got older like me they've got into the running and more and they've had children and so you you sort of carry on with them um and then I, I've still got people that still party now but I could still go out and be stupid and dance and but I don't need to do it so I think yeah I've got a lot of diff I, I've always had a very different circles of friends because obviously some of the people that I run with wouldn't and people I work with would di certainly wouldn't clash to get the clash <laughs> wouldn't go together <laughs> yeah because it's kind of mad but yeah no yeah yeah my friendship circles have definitely have definitely changed yeah so sorry you were saying about you were cycling around Malawi is this yeah. where your first challenge was this your very first yeah so it yeah it ties into why I didn't do a, why I've not done a marathon since so 
I went to Milan and then I got back in Manchester and I was working at Adidas and I sat there and all these people were like rushing out of Harvey Nichols, Selfridges. And I was thinking, no one's smiling. No one's really happy. We've got all of this stuff. So I wanted to set out on a, lot, on a sort of path of life with no regrets. I got back into the shop. There was a delivery of trainers and, you know, everyone was really excited about all these trainers, but I'd just been like, got back from Malawi where I'd heard all these, you know, really moving stories where some women had been, you know, raped and their crops had failed. And I just thought, I want a job that I want to give back. So I quit my job with Adidas and worked with children with autism. So then after I completed those two marathons, I wanted to do a fundraiser for FOMO for the charity in Malawi. So in 2011, I cycled, which was my first big challenge. I cycled John O'Groats to Land's End um, over 13 days. And then I had one day off. Um, and then I traveled to London and then ran the London Marathon in four hours. Because obviously the cycling, and obviously your legs and stuff. Um, so that but was you're using challenge. total different muscles. So how did you cope with that? My God. <laughs> <laughs> Out of everything I've done, after that marathon, my legs felt the worst. Because I think, like you say, you're completely different. You don't realise that. I just thought, oh, my cycling will just be fine. It will see me through. Like, the endurance was fine. I didn't have a problem getting to the end. It was just, you realise that being on the bike for two weeks and not running, your legs were, like, really heavy. Um, so... Um, after that challenge, I then spent a lot of, about a couple, two or three years, I'd sold everything, um, got rid of credit cards, so I had no ties here. And I spent the best part of two years traveling from the, the Amazon rainforest to trekking in the Himalayas to seeing tigers in India. And I had an amazing time, um, but it felt a bit self-indulgent. So when I got back in 2016, 2015, um, that's when I came up with the, the, that inspired me to come up with the idea to run the length of Malawi to help raise the money to help finish the school to say thank you to those children that first inspired me back in 2008 and 9. Um, so going in, into it in 2015 I ran the, the fantastic Wainwright um, 192 miles from um, St Bees to Hornsey so you go through the the Lake District North Yorkshire Moors Adels and then North Yorkshire Moors and finishing Robin Hood's Bay I did that 192 miles in eight days I then ran a marathon every I did what three marathons in 12 weeks that was just all sort of making sure that I could do it and um, so then that goes back to me not so that's why I've not raced the marathon then, then I went obviously went to run the length of Malawi where I did 27 marathons in 27 days, and we raised 35,000. So the school's wow. bill, yeah. um, the kids are all going to school. Then I ran jo John O'Groats to Land's End, which was kind of fitting because it was five years after I cycled it. Um, then I went on to run across Africa. So then going back to what we're talking about with fast marathons, I've just never had the time to go back, but it's <laughs> very, very, very at the top of my, um, top of my list to break three, out, three hours, yeah. So are you, interested in the 100 marathon club because you've done so many already or for you it's the bigger challenges and raising money because it seems that's very much in your heart now to when you're doing these events that you're making a difference to yeah. people you know whether it's children animals you seem to yeah. be that sort of person now that's got that passion that you want to do something that makes a big difference yeah, I think, I think for me, it's, I found something that I'm good at. And the one thing I'm really good at and thrive on is challenges. And I always think, well, if I'm going to do a challenge, then let's make a difference. Um, I really believe that's what we're really all here for. It's funny because at the beginning of lockdown, that's what everyone was saying. Oh, we've all slowed down. We're all going to, you know, and, I, and I'm adamant that I go back to that. We don't need to be working as hard. You don't need to be earning as much money. Of course, you need to, to earn to live, but if you actually look around people's houses or your own house, how much stuff we buy that we don't need. Um, and then, so my life is very stripped back and, and laid simple. So I really do thrive on those challenges to, to raise money and make a difference. And at the same time, my story um, for other people that have read about me or listened to other podcasts, you know, for my story to come from school with only two GCSEs um, to being completely off the rails, to then go on and do this, I think my my story should hopefully reflect that 
anyone with the right passion and drive can go on and do these things. I haven't done anything, you know, superhuman. I just, I'm just representing that what you can do and anyone can do it if they just smash through the, 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 the uh, barriers that we put up. So what advice would you give to anyone that, whether they're a runner um, or someone that wants to think about it, what's the best advice you would give them? I would always say to people, you, you only have one life and you want to grasp every opportunity with both hands. So if you've got that little niggle at the back of your head, like I want to run that marathon in the Amazon or I want to do a, you know, if you're a 5K runner and you want to do a 10K, put it to the forefront. It, the biggest thing is you've got to push yourself out of your comfort zone a little bit because that's where you learn the most about yourself. Um, I think it's about giving it 100% and not, don't compare yourself to other people, whether that's a 5K time or a 10K time. Some people are going to be better at the marathon. Some people are going to be better at the ultras or the five. And I think the best advice I would give is don't compare yourself to anyone else. As long as you give it 100%, then that's all you can do is be the best that you can be. I will end on that. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, thank you so much for doing this. You know, it's just brilliant. And um, a couple of podcasts ago, I had a gentleman called Michael Williams in Northampton who started doing the joggle just yeah. before the lockdown and then it got cancelled. He was on day four and then they cancelled it because they were being attacked on social media by other runners for you know for going ahead while the virus so it was interesting that you had done it and you had completed it all so i'll have to tell michael about you for sure yeah yeah and i can i'm happy to if there's any help then yeah i'm happy to help so yeah it's quite exciting that i'm doing the virtual race really because that even though it's still just around here i'm still going to better see the the map so it's still going to give me motivation Oh no, you're just, you are, you're just amazing. I've loved chatting to you today. So really, <laughs> thank you so much. No, please. And, you know, thank you for sharing your story. And you really are an amazing guy. And, you know, you. I, I, I love the fact that you're not just doing it to affect people. I, I, I'm a big animal person myself. So the fact that you're doing this for a zoo, and to, uh, to be fair, it wasn't until I saw your Facebook post I wasn't aware of the zoos. I know it's so stupid, it was at the back. And then yeah. I read your article and I was like, yes, what is happening with the animals? And then I shared your post and then other runners in my volunteer running group yeah. were like, wow, I didn't know this, you know, you, you've just by you, one person has raised an awareness to a few of us in Northampton alone so thank you for doing that and uh you know wish you all the best and i really hope that our paths do cross in the future and that you give you know say hello yeah, to me definitely. say hello to you but i'll definitely um keep in touch with you and i'm definitely going to monitor how you yeah. do i was going to ask if you could send me a photo that we could use what we do is leading up and as your podcast is going live and is out there we put quotes from the podcast on your picture so if you have got one of you in africa or one that just really sums you up that we could use yeah i probably yeah, yeah. i get one uh, there's loads in africa there's some really beautiful ones so Probably best one, the ones me running with the kids would be the best. Yeah, that would be brilliant if you don't mind. And I have to ask you, you've got a dog. Do you run yeah. with your dog? Uh, sometimes, but Ralph. obviously, he's running. Let me show you. Oh, wow. He looks oh. tired. Oh. <laughs> oh, he looks like he's got a bit of Airedale in him. Okay. Yeah, that's what they look like. Yeah, it's a basically yeah. a small version, but they're just, the Airedale's black and tan. Um, but they've got the white they're a lot smaller that the airedale is what i was brought up with that's the dog i wanted but living in a city and with the flat in airedale you need fields so yeah but yeah so. oh well hope yeah. you don't yeah sorry because yeah, i was building up to another challenge but obviously covid has stopped um everything for now so yeah so you were just you and ralph <laughs> do you do a park run i have to ask do you do park runs I've done several. I've done. Um, I've d I have done a few. Um, the thing is with me is I'm also a running club, Cholton Runners. Um, but the problem is that, that and that's kind of one of the things that I, I miss because I used to run when I was running those fast times. I used to run with like six guys regularly from the gym, who are all pretty nifty runners. 
And I miss all that because the problem is when you take on these big challenges, because you're covering so much distance in your training, you can't really be disturbed. So it's actually, it is actually quite solitary and like things like going to the park run, which I love. The trouble is that was always like my long runs back to back Saturday, Sundays around work. Yeah. So never the, and I know I could have ran there and then, but then by the time you lose time, I wanted to go from here and I know my 20 mile loop and it's, so I do, I do miss it all, but I'm going to be doing a lot more next year because I'm going to focus on a, run, a race next year. Yeah. Oh, good. Well, I'm going to definitely be monitoring you. So what, what, <laughs> distance, what distance do you like? Um, I've been doing marathons, so I'm I'm very small amount to you, but I started seven years ago, and these are my my 15 so far. So um, last year I did Seattle in America, and I was meant to be doing New York this year, but um, I've decided even if they go ahead, I think I'll leave it this year and just till it's calm have a year off um and then pick it up again next year so yeah marathons i just naturally seem to have fell into i'm not the fastest i'm you know i'm averaging about um five hours you know my slowest is five hours 27 that's when i turned up at a marathon just for fun and to be honest it was one of those loops you know like six loops I only yeah. went to do one loop because the goodie bag was a big bag of chocolate. And then another marathon runner who was doing his um, 72 mar 72nd marathon, should I say, knew I'd just done Barcelona and Brighton and said, you're doing a marathon. It was yeah. boiling hot. And we just had such a laugh, you know, it just ran round. And that's what I love about running. And it's, sounds like with you i just love the people the chatting um and my fastest is 446 in barcelona and that was with um the guy that plays bob in emmerdale he got me through that he was in barcelona supporting at the time and i had my name with my gb top on and uh yeah he was like come on michelle and if it wasn't for him i don't think i would have got under five hours so I'm not the quickest, but I'm, I'm I'm a runner, so you know I still class myself as a runner. You'd probably enjoy ultras. Pardon? You probably enjoy ultras. Yeah, that is my aim, and I was hoping to do one this year, but it's going to be my aim next year to do my very first one. But I'm also I'm very big on park run. I do oh. love. I'm a run director at Northampton. Um, I volunteer more than I actually run park run. Um, I do dress up on part of the Northampton crowns. So we do run around as crowns. I'm purple crown. And uh, yeah, I like to have fun as well because, you know, um, I'm going to be doing a podcast why I run, so I won't reveal too much. But uh, um, <laughs> helping others and during the lockdown, um, I'm injured at the moment. I've done the, I can't, I can't pronounce it, piriformis mus syndrome. So it's the muscle across your butt. It hits a nerve and shoots the pain down. So I've had like eight, nine weeks of no running. And for the last two weeks, I've actually been able to see a physio in person. So I'm on the road to recovery now. So I've been doing street dancing. Oh. dressing up doing yeah. street dance. I'll send you a clip yeah, through yeah. messages so you can see how mad I am I just I'm all for motivating other people and just that's why I got my own voluntary running group because I just love like you say no pressure when you was giving that advice at the end that's yeah. what I believe and I feel people need a helping hand yeah. and yeah. I, I'm willing to give that if it, yeah. you know, makes other people smile and achieve their goals. So, yeah. But, yeah, I'll let you go, Brendan, with Ralph, because it looks like he wants your attention. But thanks a lot. And yeah. is it okay? Can I use this as, like, a video on my YouTube so people that are um, deaf can see as well? Because I have got some deaf runners in my group, and yeah. they, they lip read. So yeah, if that's fine. okay. Oh, well, thank you again, and hopefully, Brendan, our paths will cross soon. Yeah, good, good luck. luck. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.